Thank you very much, and thank you to the Society of Antiquities for being very enthusiastic uh, about holding the lecture today. Um, as you've pointed out, there are some links, clear links, between the Wardle family of Leek in Staffordshire and the Society, um, which we'll explore as we go along. Um, I would like to say I'm not um, a scholar of Anglo-Saxon history. My research as a design historian relates pretty much to the 19th and 20th century. So it really is um, my research is on the facsimile, which we'll get to. But I'll outline, of course, uh, uh, different elements of the history related to the original uh, Bayer tapestry, which was the inspiration for so many people um, because of its huge importance historically. Um, I've done some little snippets at the top of various slides just so you have some historical information as we go along. 950 years of history can't be covered in 40 minutes. <laughs> it's going to be, I will leave out more than I put in. I'm very conscious of this. So um, we'll start, and um, I hope you will thoroughly enjoy the story and be inspired to go and have a look at the real thing if you haven't already. Right, where's Leek? Well, it's north of Watford. Um, it is about 30 miles south of Manchester and 15 miles north of the pottery towns of Stoke-on-Trent. So very clearly outlined by Arnold Bennett in his novels, but so entirely different uh, to the five towns that he writes about. Leek is a very interesting silk town. You develop quite differently from other silk towns such as Macclesfield and Congleton nearby, um, particularly interestingly because of its architecture and the family, the Wardle family of Leek, which inspired many leading figures in art and design to visit the town, uh, many architects of the Gothic revival area to build in this town probably more architects than have even built in a city in the same era. Um, so it's fascinating in many different ways, and it's a town that William Morris got to know very, very well uh, when he visited the Wardle family of Leek to learn his first dyeing skills. And if you travel up this street, um, you can see here, um, the w Morris would have traveled many, many times in between 1875 and 1877, when he visited Leek and stayed with the Wardle family in the little house on the left-hand side of this very elegant, handsome street of houses. The house with the red door is where Morris stayed with Thomas and Elizabeth Wardle. Um, Thomas Wardle was by then um, considered to be one of the major dyeing experts in the country. And it was he who f actually block printed by hand Thomas Waddle's, uh, William Morris's first 14 designs, many of which are now considered to be iconic textiles of that era. This is a whole other lecture in itself. But Morris stayed in this house and he wrote many important letters from this house that are much quoted in histories of Morris. So it's an important uh, monument to him. And his link with the Wardle family and the Society of Antiquities is very strong. This very delicate drawing of Moritz is done at the time when he was visiting, this is the period when he was visiting Leek uh, often, and it, I think it's very beautiful. Um, it's one of the nicest ones I've ever seen. So to give you some idea if he's a young man, he's in his early 30s, and this is one of his uh, designed snakehead, which was a highly complex design that uh, he persuaded Thomas Waddle, then a dyer, to become a printer. Quite a big change for this craftsman to make. And he invested a great deal in all the equipment, in the craft skills that you need to produce these textiles. And this alliance between William Morris and Thomas Waddle was a highly successful one. And Thomas Waddle looked back in it many years later, so it was a very difficult time. They had their differences of opinions, which were well documented, um, basically, but they remained friends uh, until Morris's death. Uh, Thomas Wardle visited Kelmscott Manor, uh, so yet another strong link with the Society of Antiquaries, and they were keen fishermen, and they went fishing there, and they had a good time, as far as I can tell. Now, the Bayer Tapestry was of great interest to Morris. 
not necessarily because of its design. We don't know that that it influenced him in any way as a designer. He was more interested in it as a political document because it it tells the story of a battle uh, which changes the way of life in England. And he was concerned, as were many of the people, about what he felt was the Norman yoke, the restriction put on British life um, as it was changed by the French invaders. So it affected various aspects of ways of life. It affected literature and the language. Um, We don't know if he ever spoke to the Wardle family about this when he visited the house, but we know certainly he went to see the tapestry with Ben Jones in 1855, Uh, did many other very eminent writers and uh, artists. Dickens went, uh, Tennyson went, and Ruskin as well, before the Wardles themselves went to visit it in Normandy. Um, Basically, I think also because it it was a political document recording something that was of great interest. At a time in the 19th century, when many people were looking back to early history, They became very fascinated by it, Um, and for a lot of people it was a romantic time. It involved kings and queens and battles, but also it changed the way of life in the way that Britain and England was governed. This is Thomas Wardle, um, with, as you can see, it was 10 of his 14 children, just after the period when he'd been working with William Morris in Leek. Um, and his wife is conspicuously absent. She was quite ill up to the birth of the youngest child, which you can see here uh, at the front. Um, and the children became involved in the dying and printing business that evolved to be one of the most highly regarded um, in the Western world, really. Thomas Wardle began to supply Liberty of London and Regent Street with huge supplies of dyed and printed textiles and particularly known for his range of silks from India. There's a very strong link with India, which again, is another lecture. Um, But these people, it's very important to point out, while they're living in a market town in Leek, which is also a silk town, (coughs) surrounded by beautiful countryside, they are not backwoodsmen. These people are, Thomas Wardle and his wife, highly integrated Um, with all the major societies in London. They had many strong links with the most of the arts and um, commercial societies in the capital. And they thought globally. Um, Leek became a successful dying centre, particularly because of the qualities of the water of the River Chernet, which flows around the town. And the river flows down from the Staffordshire Moorlands, which are very wild still, um, very beautiful, uh, full of limestone. And it's thought that the minerals from the stone get, uh, get added an important element to the uh, dyeing processes, helped fix the dyeing um, in a way that made it become a centre, really one of the best centres of dyeing in Europe. So this is what undoubtedly attracted Morris to go there. Elizabeth Wardle, who is one of the main characters in this story, by the time we get to 1875, and Morris is visiting her home often, her and her 10 surviving children, and Morris writes about the children, it's been very boisterous and noisy, but he obviously writes about them very fondly in, in a number of his letters. By the time he is in Leek, she has already worked with three major Gothic revival architects who are building there. So we're talking about uh, George Gilbert Scott Jr., John Dundee Setting, and Richard Normanshaw, all commissioned to build in this very small town, all of whom are interested in embroideries for the buildings which they design, which are stitched by Elizabeth Waddle and local women. So they are used to working on large scale, size specific pieces, doing very fine work indeed, and very detailed work indeed, using uh, silks and gold threads. Thomas would have known this courtyard outside very well because by the time he is a young man in his 30s, he's become a fellow of two societies. 
um, fellow of the Royal Geological Society, um, where he did a great deal of work on fossils. He's a man who was infinitely curious about all aspects of life, including what lay beneath his feet. And Staffordshire, Derbyshire, Borders, where he lived, is very rich in pickings. Um, and so he earned a fellowship of the Royal Geological Society, and later he gained a fellowship of the Royal Society of Chemistry. So he would have been amazed if he didn't visit this building, given the nature of his interest in the arts as well. Um, and he was a man who is running a very, very busy business. Um, he is doing a huge amount of research of his own into the wild sorts of India and the dye stuffs of India, and he becomes an expert uh, in both fields. He didn't sleep, I don't think. He couldn't have done that. <laughs> He also, I think it's important to note, they, he had a shop in New Bond Street, um, this one here, and the statue's outside, and it's obviously still here today, but you've got three statues to one of the right here's half hidden, um, which have art design and commerce written on them, which completely sums him up. And so he's selling his own products there. He's a rival at that time in commerce with William Morris and with uh, Liberty of Regent Street. So highly sophisticated people who, who prefer to stay and live in league, uh, stay very involved with the town and its um, activities as well. Now, the Bayer Tapestry, which becomes a subject of great interest in the 18th and 19th century, is housed in this building now in Normandy. It's 70 metres long by 50 centimetres, and I've just bought a small souvenir strip back from Normandy last year, and we've had to fold it over twice to, to make it fit this table, even at this scale. It would need a room twice the size of this one to display it, um, and it, but its size is, of course, one of its great interests. Uh, but it also presents the uh, people of Leek who made a facsimile of it with great problems, as you might imagine, logistical problems. Um, now, in summary, it tells the story in, in a cartoon format of Harold Hill of Wessex. Um, as you can see, he led the Saxon army to the Battle of Hastings in an attempt to defeat the Norman invasion of England. Now, this is one version of the events. Um, scholars of the Anglo-Saxon period would say there are many other versions. We're just not absolutely certain what they are. It's a long time ago. But this is the only pictorial uh, version of events. And it's felt to be fairly faithful um, in its depiction. But it's evoking a battle rather than giving a, a concrete version of it. And it does this very, very well indeed. <coughs> Sorry about the bad quality at the start. I mean, we weren't supposed to take photographs in, 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 the, in Bayer. But it gives you some sort of idea of the scale of it. It's tw about 20, minutes, 20 inches wide, which is half the width of a, a stretch of linen. It is not a tapestry, it is an embroidery, so that has to be made clear. The figures in it are not woven in, they're stitched in wool onto a linen ground. So we have wool and linen, both staple yarns in England. And whilst we don't know who commissioned it, i.e. who paid for it, and we don't know who the designer or designers were, and we don't know who the embroiderers were either. The scholarly opinion actually indicates it is of English make. And Canterbury and Winchester are thought to be the most likely places uh, where it was produced, as they had noted embroidery workshops in 1066 and just after the battle. So the battle tells the story again from 1064 to 66. It tells us of the um, lead up to the battle and it takes us through the battle and the final invasion of England. It has produced many, many conferences. It's produced libraries of works where people for centuries have been discussing its likely origin and its meaning. 
Um, at the moment, we had no clear, really, about many, many points of interest. But I think it's generally um, agreed by the scholars that it is the work of the most incredible design. And as the design historian, um, I think it is phenomenally interesting. Um, and you'll be able to have a look at how a designer managed to cover 70 metres of activity and hold the scale of battles and different aspects of daily life together. What devices did this designer or designers use? And it is incredibly sophisticated. It has no perspective. It doesn't deal with three-dimensionality. It is a linear story, and it takes you a good 20 minutes to transverse from left to right to cover the whole length of it, um, walking very slowly, and you cannot take in the wealth of detail that is displayed there. It's of three um, different um, elements, really. You have a central panel that uh, displays the main action, and you have borders, top and bottom, which gives you additional information if you can decode that information. And many scholars have tried. It's thought to be influenced by uh, classical friezes on, on Roman buildings, although we have no idea whether a designer in England ever saw anything of that nature. And probably hugely influenced by illuminated manuscripts, then held in Canterbury. Um, so very, very strong indication that that is probably where the designer operated. Um, but we don't know. Now, as you've heard in the introduction, the Society of Antiquaries commissioned a reproduction of the tapestry at a time when printing technology was changing. Um, so they actually commissioned a reproduction to be done as an engraving. And we can see here uh, evidence of that in this, this volume that's been brought down for you. It is a third of the original size, beautifully hand-coloured, and it involved quite a number of trips to France on the behalf of the uh, engraver and also the, the person who comes in the various sections faithfully. Charles Stoddard was the draftsman and Bézier the engraver. And they had to keep going backwards and forwards to France um, to keep... How they colour match this, I don't know. Um, by then, of course, the tapestry is, uh, yes, you know, hundreds of years old. It's had a very um, tr difficult life where it was, it was used in difficult circumstances, stored badly, it had to be repaired. So they managed somehow to get hold of it and to colour exactly uh, different, each scene, of each of the 58 scenes that then survived. There were probably more, probably 60, we don't know. Um, and what I find very interesting as a textile historian is they took wax impressions of the surface of it so that we can tell from those um, how the bouillon was used, how it was stitched. And below the engraving there, you can see a detail of the horse's head. You've got this engraving on paper. And, uh, and then below that, the stitch detail. And the people who stitched it, we don't know if they're men or women, probably teams of both, used two stitches only. So they fill in the main body of every character, every building, um, every horse, every other animal, with a, a stitching technique that is very simple and allows you to cover a lot of ground very quickly. Um, that is then outlined in contrasting colour in every single case. And the use of the stitch, and the use of colouring throughout this piece, the whole 70 metres of it, is absolutely extraordinary. The command of detail and the command of texture um, is, is wonderful. And through two stitches and using one yarn of wool only, they can convey houses and trees and horses and people and armour and cooking utensils 
um, the sea and just about everything. It is a feat of the most extraordinary design. And I wonder whether the um, designer worked closely with the stitchers to organise the colour schemes that also hold this very difficult composition together um, because the use of colour and how it is manipulated is incredibly interesting. Um, so, as I say, you have a central section where the main activity takes place. And then there are borders um, showing different activities, such as this farming, um, agricultural scenes of quite recognisable animals. So you have a donkey cart, you've got a horse drip, you know, pulling a plough, a farmer um, selling seeds, and so on. And it's become a source of information for historians on daily life, as well as the historical meaning of the battle itself. Um, you also have other strips running along which are composite animals and scenes from Aesop fables as well, some of which reflect on the activity that's going on in the centre band. Others, we've no idea whether it's not or it's possible to say, uh, but scenes from battles at certain points spill over into um, the lower borders, as you can see here, um, if there's no room in the central panel to, to hold all the action. And the other thing that's very interesting, design-wise, is the use of trees. Because there's certainly um, an aim on the part of the designer to depict things very realistically. You can actually see exactly, without the use of three-dimensional means, what animals are being portrayed, what they're doing, um, except for the trees, which are all incredibly stylized, And they're used to break up the scenes of activity um, at certain points. Otherwise, without them, one scene flowing in where horses and um, cavalry are travelling great distances would have no break at all. And so they're used as a, a way of dividing scenes off one from another. But why they're not more realistically portrayed, we don't know. It is thought that the designer was very well acquainted with shipbuilding because these scenes of activity um, which involve the French getting ready to actually um, invade England are very true uh, to life. The shipbuilding scenes are thought to be exactly right. Um, but I'm also interested in use of colour. And I even found myself at one point actually counting the stripes on the hulls of the different ships to see what was going on. I couldn't find any two that were the same. So you've got uh, realistic life and, and a build up to the major battle going on, but you've also got a designer who's very interested in how three or four colours can be manipulated. And it, it provides somewhat a carnivalesque. Um, theme in a way, although this is very serious and very violent battle, but he's portraying the ships using three or four colours only. And it's the, also a great use of a beautiful curving line, which we can see later when the ships start to cross the channel. So we have the French preparing to invade England for all sorts of various historical reasons. We have the English already in battle in Yorkshire um, and expecting great trouble. Um, we have no um, scenes in this tapestry that depict the English preparation, but we know they're in York and we know the armies have to travel down to the south coast to fight off the invaders. We have scenes of feasting going on, um, so food preparation here for the army, this is the French army. And we know it is because the designer has, is depicting the French as men without uh, moustaches, with hair that's cut high, very at the back, very high at the back, where the English have flowing locks and facial hair. So this is quite an intro, otherwise you can't actually tell who's who because um, they are all fighting each other. Haley's Comet is depicted, which is uh, logged as an event that actually happened. 
And it's seen as a sign of great foreboding, actually, on the part of the um, soldiers, um, who are all pointing at it, as you can see, and looking quite scared. So they changed their plans because of the uh, sighting of Halley's Comet, which is logged at a certain date. So there are certain ways of, of um, confirming what went on. So as well as the Society of Antiquaries um, commissioning a whole set of engravings, um, the Department of Science and Art in 1873 commissioned a set of, of photographs to be taken, which involved many trips to France also. But it gave um, a full-size copy of the tapestry as it was in France, and the photography is phenomenal. It shows the weave of the linen ground, it shows where various repairs have taken place, and it is um, still in uh, what is now the v &A, in 20 rolls, as it would have been in the beginning, um, and very fragile, as you might imagine. They had two sets of these images on display at South Kensington Museum for many years, on a drum-like mechanism with a handle, so the public could unroll it um, when they were in one of the departments, and invariably this mechanism broke down, never to be repaired. Um, but in fact, the photographs were backed onto linen and were lent to the Wardle family of Leek um, in the house we saw, uh, living in that house, and they were able to borrow them from the South Kensington Museum to copy. And you can see from these drawings here um, the repairs that have gone over the years in France um, as the, this huge tapestry was fairly badly treated over many years. Um, Elizabeth Wardle um, was able to uh, use members of her stitching community to copy um, these photographs. Now, they were allowed to do that because they had a very great relationship with South Kensington Museum. The di then director was a friend of the Woodle family. Uh, they had already purchased many examples of leak embroidery um, to display in the museum as examples of um, how one can use India's dye stuffs and India's wild silks. It was a museum of trade very much then and it was to encourage trade with India that they were displaying these things. And they were getting examples of the best stitching techniques using Indian wild silks from Leek. Um, and so there was to be an agreement uh, between them that they could borrow these. How they were transported to Leek, we don't know. Um, and what's evident here, you can see in one of the lower borders, is a, a depiction of nudity which was great, caused great distress at the time. Um, the more graphic details have been scraped off the surface of the photograph because they were pretty, um, yeah, pretty detailed. Um, and there's quite a few examples of these um, throughout the border activity, which, as we know, is one of the uh, often more unsavory aspects of war, which is daily life as well. By the time that uh, Elizabeth Wardle had decided, having been to Bayer with her husband Thomas, and having seen the copies of the Bayer tapestry at South Kensington Museum, that England should have a copy of her, its own, they had possibly moved to this rather larger Georgian house where they stayed, although we don't quite know. But even then, I think the logistics of borrowing 20 rolls of fragile photographs from the museum Having somebody from Leek, a young art student, copy every single detail of the 70 metres, copying the colours as well, and she said they were done um, as closely as possible to the original as it was seen at that time. Um, and in a house full of children, um, we don't know, we have just absolutely no idea of how this was organised, uh, but it was a feat um, of the most tremendous um, skills on Elizabeth Wardle's behalf. 
She must have had a major overall plan when she conceived the notion of copying the Bayet tapestry, and she must have had fairly other detailed plans that came into play as time went on. She was able to organise 35 women, most of whom lived locally, most of whom had worked on ecclesiastical embroideries for major architects, but not all of them. And some lived in London, some lived in Derbyshire, others lived in Macclesfield in Cheshire. Now, trying to understand how you get a bunch of 35 people together, that they have the appropriate skills that you need to do work of such importance, uh, is beyond my understanding. Um, I don't know how they organise the transference of knowledge, really, in terms of what colour to use and what point in this very detailed um, scene after scene. We don't know because we'd have no records at all, apart from a very small envelope I found in the local history library um, in Leek, which had these, this um, tiny scraps of paper folded over, a little list on it, which was then scratched out, showing things like horse's left leg, red, um, hair, blue, shoes, yellow. And different women, I feel, must have looked at the particular section they were assigned to stitch out of the 58 scenes and made notes of what colours went where in the handwriting. And on this particular uh, paper, we can see outlines of little parts of buildings and feasting here, not all of them. Um, so this is one way of transferring knowledge, I suppose, of what colours exactly went where. There were eight shades of um, wool dyed by Thomas Wharton, who by then uh, was the world's greatest expert on natural dyeing. And he was going back and researching and done this with William Morris as well looking at natural dyes as they would have been used then in the time of the original. Um, there was a young woman called Lizzie Allen who traced the photographs lent from South Kensington Museum, each part of which would have to be pinpricked um, through paper to transfer the design to the linen ground using little puffs of charcoal as it was then, then all the details would then have to be filled in. And they completed the whole task within a year. Elizabeth Wardle also wrote a guide to the Bayer Tapestry in which she um, explains what is happening in each of the different 58 scenes. It's taken from a much larger work by Collingwood Bruce but practical woman that she was, this is quite a small piece about this big, which would have been pocket size, so you'd have been able to hold it quite clearly in front of each scene of action in the tapestry and know what's going on. Otherwise, you really is, well, she might know it's a battle. You wouldn't necessarily know whether it was the French or the English or whoever, and what other things were happening in that scene without her a lovely guide. The use of colour is amazing, the facial expressions are amazing, different scholars have spent a lot of time just looking at the um, facial expressions on the figures, which are very um, real, they, you know, they, are, they tell details of different physiognomies really. But it's possible to work out that, and I don't know if this is the designer, because nobody does, or whether it's the needlewoman, but using four colours on the whole, you will find in groups such as this, no two tunics are the same, uh, worn with different coloured hose, different coloured shoes, belts and hats. And there's a method of colour control that goes from end to end of this tapestry in this way. So you can distinguish uh, different figures if you want to trace the act of a particular king or a knight. But also it's a use of colour that holds a very complicated um, and lengthy history together by this harmonious use of mainly four colours and every colour that's used to depict let's say a tunic will have a contrasting colour outlining it and that's repeated end to end. So the use of the understanding of colours and how colours interact with each other is extraordinary. 
Um, I mentioned the curving line before, and it's particularly evident um, in this scene of boats crossing the channel. This is the French sailing for uh, England. Um, but the curving line of the sails the, is echoed in the shields of the cavalry um, on the boats here, where they've hung them over the side, this sort of almond-shaped scenes. Um, the scenes on the hulls of the boats are echoed in the water as well. It is incredibly elegant. It's a very sophisticated understanding of the use of line with colour. Um, and Ruskin writes about the use of water, the depiction of water here, and likens it to scenes he's seen in, in Egyptian war paintings. He was so admiring of this work and its designs, particularly its design elements. One major difference between the copy that was made by the 35 women in Nick and the original tapestry is the blue border at the bottom of each scene. And Elizabeth Wardle and the women who worked each particular section of this have signed their names, so we know who did what. Um, and that's interesting, because we often hear about anonymous needlewomen, but in the case of Leek, they were always identified. Their work was known in, in the town, who did what. And that continues here, um, which is... I think, um, a great acknowledgement of the standard of the women's workmanship. We've got more of the same. Um, I have here a copy um, of the Textile Society Journal text for you to have a look at. There are two learned articles here by great scholars of Anglo-Saxon history. And one is talking about the buildings, uh, and one is talking about the four fools that she spotted. So if you want to have a look at um, why the buildings are like this and what they perhaps might mean, it's a very detailed and scholarly article. Um, other things going on in the border. I'll just move through things. So these are all the leak copies. People ask, why have we got horses in blue and yellow and horses in red? Um, and it's been uh, suggested that this is done because there is no um, use of uh, perspective, but colour does give you some indication of distance, but it also distinguishes one um, animal from another. Otherwise, there would be one sort of murky mass of grey and brown. So it's partly an aesthetic thing, but it's partly also the fact that these steeds are important. The uh, Normans were great cavalrymen, very proud of it, and their animals are depicted, although not in great detail. Um, the, it's acknowledged that the designer had a great understanding of horsemanship. By the way, he's depicting uh, the, their movements and so on. Now, why did Elizabeth Waddle do this? We know that, as I've mentioned, she'd worked with some major architects, including Richard Norman Shaw, who one of his main churches was built in Leek. And this is one of the only altar front, this is the only altar front he ever designed for his buildings. So they were working in sections when they stitched altar frontals such as this. They were not as similar to the format of the tapestry scenes. Some of them are anything between about what was then eight to ten feet wide. Highly detailed, um, highly um, symbolic, uh, using lettering, plant forms and other forms. So, and requiring a great deal of needlework skills that were far finer than that used in tapestry. Um, in this particular detail from an altar frontal design by John Dundit setting, you can see architectural features, you can see the pelican feeding her young in great detail and stitched very finely. But also, interestingly, at the top of this body of work, you'll find that the women had stitched their names in acknowledgement way before uh, they embarked on the tapestry copy in 1885. So it's a tradition that was alive in Leek, acknowledging the, the, the needlewomen and their skills very clearly, but they were capable of doing far finer work. So, again, 
and lettering, of course, um, which is scattered throughout the original and tells us in, in detail what is happening in some of the scenes. So a, a useful adjunct to the cartoon-like pictures and the action that's going on. And so really, in all, the League women and Elizabeth Wardle had actually great experience of doing this uh, sort of work, and all the elements that are in the tapestry have been practiced before in Leek for its own community. So uh, there is also a link with Elizabeth Wardle's brother, George Y. Wardle, with William Morris. He was born in Leek, as she was, and he became the manager of Morris's company for 20 years at a time when it was going through major expansion. Um, these stitches, these embroideries of very fine angels are taken from his drawings. So this is typical of their work um, before they embarked on the copy of the Abbey at Tapestry. At the end, you have an acknowledgement to Thomas Wardle, who dyed the wool, and of all the women um, who stitched it. When it was completed in, after the year, um, which in itself is phenomenal, it then went on a major tour around Britain. And I can't help but feel that Elizabeth Wardle had this in mind before she embarked on the um, project in the first place. It was never meant to be hung in her home, so where was it going to go? What was she going to do with it when it was finished? And basically, the tour must have been something that has planned in the very early stages. Otherwise, what was, it, where was, it, what was his life going to be? Um, and included in that was a major tour to America in 1886. So uh, six months after it's completed, it's going off to the States. where it was received um, with a great deal of publicity in all the major newspapers there. And it was displayed in New York in a major gallery um, uh, of great interest to uh, embroiderers and followers of the arts and crafts movement. And it's clear from looking at the American um, journalists and their columns that they knew exactly who Thomas Wood was, who Elizabeth Wood was, and the nature of the work. And it, it was actually written about as it was crossing the Atlantic. So there's a great build-up before it arrives in the state. And at certain uh, venues, um, and these are all on the uh, Eastern Seaboard, um, you have people giving lectures about it. There are poems written about it. And there's a great dis um, description of how it's hung in one gallery. Otherwise, I have wondered often how on earth this 70-metre long work went from venue to venue in different towns across the country. Um, in the venues that were totally different, sometimes for two days, sometimes for months on end. Who was in charge of this? Who dealt with the logistics of it? Who hung it? This fragile textile, all textiles are fragile. Who put it up? Who took it down? Who transported it? We don't know, but somebody did. But in one of the American newspapers, there's a great description of how it has hung on supports. Uh, which wind across the room, in and out, creating little chambers for people to walk around. Um, so one can only presume this is what happened in other venues when it was um, shown. And this life continued really until the um, 1890s, when it was shown um, at Reading in the town hall with um, a view to purchase. Um, Reading Museum now houses the Leek facsimile of the Bear Tapestry because whilst it was shown in Leek um, just shortly after it was stitched, um, it was never kept in the town, much to everybody's regret now, as you might imagine, and particularly Elizabeth Wardle's regret uh, that the town never held on to it. Um, so it was bought by Alderman Hill, um, who presented it to the town of Reading, where it is now. Um, and in the 1920s, the Margaret, Lady Gaunt, uh, one of the little girls you saw in the early photograph, saw it hung in Reading and was horrified. It was blackened, it had been cut into, it was nailed to the wall, it was too high, and the lighting was poor, and she offered to buy it back. Uh, but Reading wouldn't uh, sell it back to the family, but they have cleaned it, it's now on display in the Reading Museum, and it is extremely popular. Oh, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you'll go and see it.